Will the future look more like Star Trek or more like Mad Max? When I ask that question in Seattle or San Francisco, everybody says, Star Trek. When I ask that question in my native West Virginia or in West Baltimore where I started my career, people say Mad Max. Is that whether the future looks more like Star Trek or more like Mad Max comes down to a distinctly human question that we are not going to be able to outsource to algorithms. Will we rewrite our social contract? What's a social contract? A social contract is an agreement between the government, citizens, and the private sector that defines and limits the responsibilities and duties of each. It holds that all of our political and moral obligations have to be both formally and informally codified so that we can live in a functional society. Now, for the longest time, uh, the world didn't have much of a, a social contract. During the early empires, uh, the leader, whether it was an emperor, a king, or a khan, uh, was treated almost like a god. And basically, everybody lived to be the god's subject and worked for his greater glory. And this held for thousands of years uh, and changed significantly the, for the first time in the West, with the first real Western social contract was feudalism. Feudalism, the nobles would hold the lands for the crown in exchange for taxes and military service. And the peasants, in turn, would be obliged to live on their lord's land and provide homage, labor, and a share of the harvest, uh, notionally in exchange for military protection and the right to stay on the land. This was the social contract of the agricultural age. This was the contract that existed when more than 80% of all labor took place on the farm, where most of our economic activity was rooted in keeping ourselves fed. Uh, and it was the first time where we began to look at each member of society as being dependent on the other. And it was inspired in significant measure by St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, which I wanted to read a little bit from to you. In St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, it said, Now the body is not a single part, but many. If a foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It does not for this reason belong any less to the body. Or if an ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It does not for this reason belong any less to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God placed the parts, each one of them in the body, as he intended. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. Nor again the head to the feet, I do not need you. Indeed, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary. And those parts of the body we consider less honorable we surround with greater honor, and our less presentable parts are treated with greater propriety, whereas our more presentable parts do not need this. But God has so constructed the body as to give greatest honor to a part that is without it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. Now, this concept of interdependence is at the heart of every social contract. And this social contract of the agricultural age lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years until three things really propelled its change. Capitalism, the introduction of a limited form of democracy, and industrialization. Uh, with this, a new social contract for the industrial age. And a lot of this was catalyzed by innovation in science and technology. Uh, so for example, uh, the mechanization of the farm, the inventions like the cotton gin, made it less necessary for there to be so many farm workers. Uh, the invention of the printing press 
created a more informed public that demanded uh, some limited forms of democratic participation. Other inventions from science and technology that propelled us from an agricultural age into an industrial age included things like the steam engine and the production of industrial chemicals. Now, as labor moved from farm to factory and from countryside to city, a new social contract was written over a period of, of many, many decades. And some of its key components were things like a 40-hour work week, a minimum wage, social insurance, the social net, free public education. And this, this social contract of the industrial age has existed now for going on 200 years, more or less. But we are once again at one of those very rare inflection points. We're moving from an industrial age to an information age. And so we need to rewrite that contract. Land was the raw material of the agricultural age. Iron was the raw material of the industrial age. Data is the raw material of the information age. He who owned the land and controlled the land during the agricultural age had the power. He who owned the factories and controlled access to the natural resources during the industrial age had the power. He or she who own the data, control the data, or can harvest meaning from the data are those who have the power today and tomorrow. Now, just as inventions like the printing press and the cotton gin propelled us from an agricultural age into an industrial age, so too are today's technologies propelling us from an industrial age into an information age. And the Internet's just the beginning of it. You know, other technologies like artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, all of these things are reshaping the relationship between the governing and the governed. It's reshaping the relationship between citizen, corporation, and state uh, for both good and ill. As we think about the implications of this transition from an industrial economy into an information-based economy, we need to think about what those transition points that are that we can take advantage of. And think about who's being harmed within this. If we think about some of the technologies that are emerging, for example, like, like artificial intelligence and 3D printing, uh, these technologies place great strains on the working class because they are inherently automation technologies. So these technologies are freeing for many, but for others they cause real problems rooted in economics. As we think about the incisions that we need to make in our society right now, as we transition from an industrial-based economy into an increasingly technology-rich knowledge-based economy, one of the things that we need to recognize is that the way technology is evolving is it is advantaging capital over labor. So for example, uh, most of the innovations that have taken place in recent years in things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, and the internet, uh, they advantage capital. They in advantage intellectual capital, and they advantage financial capital. They advantage those people who are the investors, and they advantage those people who are the entrepreneurs. And we value ever more highly skilled talent that can work in those knowledge-based sectors. While the talent that is lower skilled in what we associate with the working class, the value that we attach to that uh, continues to stagnate. Human beings are not as easy to update as software. And this is what's fueling the disillusion. This is what's fueling the fear uh, in working class America. A, a winner-takes-all economy in which uh, the working class has very limited access is, is a recipe for a dysfunctional democracy. Uh, this is what unites West Virginia with West Baltimore. This is the Star Trek 
Mad Max binary. When too many people are left behind, this in turn fuels the hatred and the unrest that we've already begun to see. This is being exacerbated by filter bubbles that we've created through social media and through, and through cable news. Uh, it ought to be the case that abundant access to information and each other creates a more cohesive society uh, and cross-cultural understanding. But in fact, part of what we've seen is that it actually highlights the differences between the haves and the have-nots, and it creates a space for extremist ideologies to grow. There's a period in history that most people have forgotten called the Engels Pause, which was between about 1800 and 1840. And this, too, was a period of really fast technological innovation with stagnating standards of living for the working class. And some of its byproducts were things like the Communist Manifesto and the largest wave of revolutions in Europe's history. I think we are at sort of an Engels pause in the United States right now, where technology is, tra is transforming the relationship between government, corporation, and citizen, but we haven't yet updated our social contract to account for that change. Uh, and it's not good enough to just sort of graft the industrial age programs onto the information age industries. You know, think, for example, about labor. As more labor goes from being employer-based uh, to being freelanced and brokered through uh, online platforms, traditional worker protections like pensions and workers' compensation aren't there. So it's not good enough to just sort of insist that we graft the industrial age protections onto these information age programs. We need to think anew we need to think anew about what we want the relationship between corporation, citizen, and state to be. What I really want to do is get you thinking about what you think the elements of a new social contract should be. What should be in a new social contract? Uh, but for the purposes of sort of getting popcorn popping in your head, uh, I did want to throw out two possibilities. I want to sort of throw out two things that I think should be in the social contract for the information age. Number one, uh, we need to fix the single biggest problem of the industrial age. We need to stop climate change. Uh, and to do this, I believe that business needs to go carbon neutral. Business will produce no product and no service where it does not either produce or purchase an, offset, an, an offsetting amount of carbon offsets. Now, this would take decades to do, but it is worth doing. And it's not meant to be punitive. It's not, you broke it, you buy it. Remember why we have a social contract in the first place. It's, it's so we can do something where we all ultimately benefit. And we all benefit, including business, if we live on a habitable planet. The only way we save the planet and, and have a place for economic activity to even take place is if we stop climate change. Big social contract idea number two. Society was rigidly hierarchical during the agricultural age. If you were born rich, you died rich. If you were born poor, you died poor. It was based entirely on blood, and it was determined the day that you were born. We then saw some progress during the industrial age, where we began to see mobility between economic and social classes, and where limited forms of democracy allowed people to begin to vote and decide who would be their governors. But what we now see, what we now see is that race, religion, and gender are still too deterministic of economic opportunity. And my second and last big idea for what should be a component in our social contract of the future is that we commit to being a society of radical non-discrimination. And that we take this recent moment of history of ours where we've seen a surge in hatred, uh, it based in part on race, religion, and gender, that's rooted in significant measure because of the difficulties converting from an industrial-based economy into an information-based economy. Let's take the hatred that has emerged recently 
and let's make it the end of a piece of history rather than the beginning of a piece of history. So those are my two ideas, but please think about what you think should be the elements of a social contract for the future. Uh, will the future look more like Star Trek or more like Mad Max? It's entirely up to us. Thank you. <laughs>